My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. We have Jim Mafood in the house for the second episode of our new show. We'll call, we call it Talk and Shoot, man. Why? Because we don't want to be bound by the weekly schedule of the KFA <laughs> weekly right. shoot, man. Uh, Jimmy, what, what, uh, what's the date? September 17th. We had some good stuff this past week, man. Uh, that Jeff Darrow shoot interview hit hot and heavy. I was I was getting nervous on on Sunday when its ranking was a little low, and then I was like, oh yeah, people just sleep in on Sundays, man. Quickly rose to the top, man. At least uh, thirteen thousand people have checked the video out right now. A lot of great feedback. Yeah, I love seeing the notes and talking to Jeff about it and follow up and being <laughs> like, read the comments, Jeff. Enjoy the comments. Yeah, for sure, man. He's such a humble guy, such a nervous guy. Whenever we speak to him on the phone, you could almost always expect that email back from him where he's like i'm so sorry i took up so much of your time and to me it's senpai kohai like tell me everything give me every piece of information you have man the weirdest part of my life as a cartoonist is the phone schedule because if i'm coloring stuff i can talk to you for six hours <laughs> but if i'm writing something like Zero. i don't even want the phone to ring <laughs> yeah this past uh this past wednesday i just want to get a couple quick plugs out of the way man because i had some stuff hit the shops man red room the Antisocial Network, issue number four, the last of season one. You know, we're going to be doing these four issue blasts. We're going to take a little time off to for the trade paperback, let that exist on the shelves for a month or two, then hit you with the blast of another season of monthly issues, man. So this issue hit the stands this past Wednesday, the, the 15th. couple different flavors of this some bitch, man. Got to get that cartoonist kayfabe variant if your store got that. Too. Jimmy, do you not nice. envision... Do you not envision a day where every comic we make hits has like a cartoonist kayfabe variant? Ever since we did this one, I've been thinking about it for, for the book I'm working on and what, how it could look. What are you working on again? <laughs> Coming soon. How about every comic has a cartoonist kayfabe where it's just like a standard, you know, like a swimsuit variant. Hey, yeah. hey, Jim Lee. I don't know if anyone's demanding the swimsuit <laughs> variant, Tom. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll sell extra copies. But uh, this issue sold more than uh, even the second issue. This is the second highest uh, circulated Fantagraphics comic out there after Red Room issue number one. And then the third one is Red Room issue number two. But it's on the strength of you goosing the numbers, man, with these awesome variants you've been doing for each issue. This is the Spawn variant with Donna Butcher. <laughs> so you did, so you did uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Todd McFarlane's Spawn. Uh, you did 8-Ball and uh love and rockets love and rockets man so so uh is there some through line to this <laughs> mount rushmore of indie comics right <laughs> mount rushmore of creator creator owned indie comics speaking of jeff darrow man this is the this is the uh cover that he did that i was very unapologetic in asking for just uh, in, in our random you know three hour conversations but one other thing uh is out in the wild we reprinted issue number one uh with with a sketch cover man yeah. because that that first round went really really quick man so there are about 10,000 of these out there uh, that push the numbers for Red Room Issue number one almost to 100K, man. So I got to thank the Kayfabe audience, got to thank you guys helping me pimp this stuff out. Congratulations on the second printing. Congratulations on number four outselling issue yeah. two. I mean, like that is really the rare thing on her comics. On her Amazing. Yeah. That's that's. <laughs> Yeah, the best news. A lot of it's on the strength. Like like this is the highest selling variant, which that's awesome. Because yeah. because, because we <laughs> have this this audience because we have this crowd this platform uh i think that this is a must like like i'm already thinking about what our kayfabe variant for the next round is going to be jimmy do you picture that the the person who's perpetrated this violence against us <laughs> probably tom right his, his picture's not on the cover where is he on this cover you know that's not bad that's not bad uh, my weapon of choice is a t-square <laughs> <laughs> jim mafu did you hear the uh jeff darrow conversation I did, man. It was awesome. It, uh, whenever you guys do shoot interviews with people, I'm always like looking at the background at his bookshelves to see like what's going on back there. And then I'm kind of working while the interview's playing. But as soon as he's like, oh, check this out, I have to look up and see what he's showing because he's showing like roughs, he's showing pencils and inks. And um, it's so crazy, man. I love everyone's different ways of working styles of working seeing his pencils and how detailed and finished they are and then him having to ink all that i mean that <laughs> it almost like gives me anxiety thinking about <laughs> it because so much of my work is just done straight in the inking phase like that's where my style comes from that when i see people 
like him working in that way it's like this is just fucking mind-blowing to me man like the level of craft and time and uh patience that you know his work requires it's it's staggering you know it's it's almost the exact opposite of what i'm doing but that's the joy of of art and comics and uh making visuals to me is just like everyone's different unique approach to it and that's what i mean that's what's cool about the interviews that you guys do it's kind of like it's not just uh you know asking about fan you know whatever fan shit or whatever. it's like craft and technique and that's what we want to hear you know you know what my food man i'm seeing you on cam and i realize how long it's been since we kicked it man i miss you dude i miss you guys too yeah how was how was your lockdown this comic uh that that i see uh propped up right there man is this uh, a consequence of your covid lockdown time yeah, um, I actually started issue one of this new Girl Scout series I have coming out. It's called Girl Scout Stone Ghost uh, out in late November from Image Comics. You can pre-order right now through November 1st at your local comic shop. Um, started it in 2018, the first issue, and then got distracted with freelance work and life and whatnot. And then went to Japan at the end of 2019, Japan and Singapore, got back, started issue two off the inspiration of that trip. And then, you know, two, three months later, the lockdown hit. And then I was able to uh, crank out the rest of the series. The other interesting thing that happened is I got a um, optioning deal for the Girl Scouts as an animated series with Disney, uh, they were going to do an adult animated block on the streaming service Freeform. So um, Margot Robbie and her husband contacted me and they're fans of the comic. And they said, you know, can we pitch this as a show or a movie? And I was like, oh, uh, fuck, yeah, sure. So we came up with a pitch. I went to L.A. in 2019, pitched it to every studio. Disney bought uh, went, went for it. And then all of 2020, the lockdown, I was also working on the pilot, the animated show. So, um, the cool thing, the pilot did not work out after a year of working on it in December of 2020, they wound up passing on it. But the good thing that came out of it is, um, I developed an entire backstory for the whole history of the Girl Scouts where they come from, what this is all about, their full universe, all the characters for this pitch. And so I wound up just using all that in the, the comic, all the character designs I did for the animation, all the stuff I created, um, wound up using that. And I'm going to continue to do that for the comics. And I even brought on like my boy, Mike Huddleston to come on board and do like concept art backgrounds world building for the cartoon so he designed like the girl scouts brownstone that they live in with a skateboard half pipe in the backyard and a subway all this brilliant stuff man and all that will just be in the comic um we had damien scott on character design with me i was doing character designs he was doing turnarounds we had peter chung eon flux as our director uh like I said, Margo and her husband producing and Star Burns, the animation studio that made the first season of Rick and Morty as our animation studio. So we were off and running. And so all of 2020, I was working on this show, but also the comic. When they killed the show, I was uh, very upset, needless to say. Um, and I was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to work on the book. Like I'm fully investing 110% of my energy into the book. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to report into anybody. I'm writing, drawing, you know, lettering, coloring this one. It's all me. It's the most me thing I've ever done. Um, so it's been, you know, greatly rewarding. And uh, real quick too, I wanted to mention like, for those watching that have no idea what this Girl Scouts thing is about, just wanted to go through real quick. Uh, this is something I started self-publishing in 1995 with um, 
these oversized publications I was putting out while I was in art school. The original spelling, the Girl Scouts of America eventually saw these and sent me a cease and desist letter. So Mike Huddleston was my roommate at the time in art school, as was Nathan Fox. And Mike was like, oh, just uh, just change the spelling. Uh, you know, so like the riot girl movement was going mm -hmm. on, like Bikini Kill. I was hanging out with girls at art school that wore combat boots and smoked clove cigarettes and stuff. And we're listening to Bikini Kill and had all these dope riot girl zines. So I was like, oh, I'll just change it to the G double R L. And then their next appearance was in Cosmic Toast, self-published anthology, 1996. Um this was the career changing moment for me. This book got me the Generation X underground special, which then got me the clerk's comic book with Kevin Smith. And I established a, rep uh, a relationship with Oni. We did the first Girl Scouts in 90, 97, 98. This is a collection through Image. Work sucks in... Um, 2003 also from image and then i took like a 14 year break <laughs> and uh back to them in 2017 with magic socks those three trades i just showed are uh still in print and available through image and um i have to mention too real quick with girl scout stuff in 2015 we actually did a live action pilot for a tv show that is batshit crazy. And if people go to YouTube and just enter in Girl Scouts pilot, um, it was for Ron Howard's production company. He formed a thing called New Form Digital, where he was giving aspiring badass YouTube directors a shot to make a pilot of a show and gave them a budget. So I was teamed up with this brilliant director named Mike Diva. Um, and we wrote it together. Mike directed it. It's absolutely insane and amazing. And uh, Mike has since gone on to like direct music videos for Run the Jewels. He did a thing with Lonely Island on Netflix called The Bash Brothers. That's about Jose Canseco. Yeah. And it's nuts. So Mike's super talented, but we actually got to, you know, like cat, we went to uh, the Google lot and had a casting session and girls were lined out the door dressed as the Girl Scouts. It was super surreal. And then um, we shot over the course of a week, this pilot pitched it, nothing happened with it. So Girl Scouts is one of those things that's been with me since 1995. And it's kind of like um, all inspired by my love and obsession with Tank Girl and Jamie Hewlett's art basically. If you see behind me right there, that's a centerfold poster from Deadline Magazine of Tank Girl on her couch with the shotgun with Booga in the foreground. And I, I bought that in the early 90s from like Tower Records and it's hung in every studio and apartment and house I've lived in since that time. And discovering his work when I was like a freshman in college, like 93, it was just like a fucking lightning bolt through my brain of like, okay, okay, this is the exact type of comics I want to make. Like, I want to do this fresh, flavorful, sexy, irreverent, middle finger in the air type comic vibe, you know, and mix in elements of like underground hip hop and graffiti and, um, but it's all, I mean, it's all sort of due to uh, this obsession with Jamie's work and, and the vibe of what those guys were doing and all the other sensibility that was happening at the time. And I just got lucky and got to school and, and met Huddleston right away. He was like a year ahead of me and Nathan Fox was in my class. And these guys were just, they were, we were the comic guys in our art school and we were just constantly inspiring each other. We were doing the school thing and the assignments, obviously, but off to the side, we were all doing our comics hustle and self-publishing. And that was just kind of a, um, a thing that was happening in the 
in the mid nineties. It was, I was trying to break in as an inker as well. So I had an inking portfolio that I would go to conventions and show inking samples. And Mike and I got a couple random gigs. Like we did like a Legion of Superheroes story for Showcase 95 for DC that he penciled, I inked. We did like the first three issues of Rust at Caliber that it didn't sell. We made literally no money, but um, it's so crazy, man. We used to just do projects and make zero dollars, but it was like, you'll get published. Your book will be on the shelf. And, you know, it was, uh, it was the epitome of like paying dues and uh, starting at, at, at the ground floor and working your way up. So the fact that like Mike and I are still best friends and still freelancing, making a living off our art, we text each other a couple times a week with our new pages we're working on. Um, he's doing a brilliant new book right now called Decorum at Image that John uh, Hickman's writing and his work in it is just staggering. It's absolutely brilliant. So it's cool to like come up with someone. I mean, I, I know you guys have that in Pittsburgh where it's like, you have your crew, you have your, your brothers in arms. And, and you kind of like, when you go through this together and you're in it for the long haul, it, it's, it's this bond that's sort of um, unbreakable. And you, you start speaking this language where, if I call Mike, I forget to ask how he's doing. I'm just like, dude, I have this like, I have this layout issue I'm having with the cover for issue three or whatever. And he's like, send me, yeah, the, the sketch or whatever, you know? So it's like, it's just this immediate language you have with, with people um, that makes, it makes the isolation. It makes the, the um, alone time, uh, I think worth more worthwhile when you know you're not in it alone yeah for sure man you know taking it back to that that darrow piece uh when he was talking about getting phone calls from dave stevens to like work mm -hmm. out the perspective that's exactly what i was thinking on, of on, yeah. on, on his work when it was a time like before like the internet and they had to do it over the phone or something like by way of like fax machine or something like jesus like how do you fix a guy's perspective that, and then, <laughs> yeah, like, right. like uh verbally like like you're like you're calling the <laughs> nintendo helpline yeah to uh you know fix your perspective it's like a text adventure you're like describing <laughs> yeah. the angle. Right. one of the things that i took from 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 the jeff daryl conversation is just really i appreciated his effort in not hiding flaws in his art or something like like trying to understand things in three dimensions and not spotting blacks and you know he was he was he was thumbing some open wounds to, to be because uh, I'm a firm believer in that, uh, you know, when in doubt, black it out kind of a yeah. philosophy, because I just can't conceptualize some stuff. And one of the things that I always took away from his work is, is it, it feels like he believes it, but like the things that he's drawing, like, it feels so, uh, there's so much life to it. And, and throughout the course of the conversation, when he's talking about drawing certain things, and he's like, there's a wing nut here and a blah, blah, blah. like he is, it's that Tothian thing of like, you got to understand the thing before you draw it. And he was demonstrating that in the conversation, talking about all the like little nuts and bolts that go into everything. Like he's not just drawing shapes. Right? Well, who, who's like the nearest cartoonist adjacent to Jeff Darrow? And wouldn't it be like Otomo? You know, that kind of like thorough, obsessive, like way more detail than anybody would ever need. But it's just it's just so important to them. And, and so, you know, it becomes important to, to us, you know, as readers. You know. There's a plug for the future, by the way, because because uh, Jim Mahfoud mentioned Tank Girl. You guys are going to want to be here on uh, Sunday for our shoot interview that we're going to be putting live, man, because you're going to see some cool original Tank Girl art through the through the webcam. And you're going to see uh, Jim's jaw drop as well as mine. <laughs> and we should say it's not Jamie Hewlett. Right. I don't want people to be disappointed by, by, by it because it's a fantastic interview. Yeah, you're not going to be disappointed. It's, uh, it's interesting to hear Jim's story and the history of the Girl Scouts and how that how that checks in at different levels of yeah. where he's at as an artist, you know, from self-publishing it in the beginning. And I see parallels with somebody like a Jeff Darrow that has Shaolin Cowboy going through different publishers and at different stages in his career as well. I think that's a really interesting piece. Um, I don't always hear that when people talk about 
you know, the, the reasons to do your own characters or to own your own work. Um, you know, speaking of doing a TV pilot, doing an animated, you know, an animated pilot, uh, you only get to do that and be involved if you own the, you know, if it's right. yours, if you create right. it from the get go. So I think that's a real inspiring part of, of what makes comics great is that you can make this stuff yourself and it can compete with whatever's going on at, you know, mm-hmm. Disney or, or uh, Time Warner or wherever the case may be. It's like, you can make Girl Scouts and have Ron Howard show up with money and say, let's let's shoot some of this and see what happens. You know what, Jim Mahfoud, anecdotally, this this might be semi interesting to you, man. Uh, but working with Harvey Pekar over the years, you know, I, I connected with him after the movie was made and he said he actually liked it best whenever he was getting that 100 G's a year for the option. Gig. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because he basically got 100 racks when the movie was made and and that faucet turned off but what happened was the book sales increase obviously for 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 a while and and the opportunities that came in increased by by a big margin you know like that's how that's how my stupid ass gets in the game man because he just gets so many opportunities and doesn't have enough artists willing to work for a hundred dollars a page man so he's got to recruit some new talent you know right but uh there's there is value in just like having it out there getting that hush money from Steven Spielberg for a year or two and then uh, getting the rights back and doing it all over. You know, he, he was getting that hundred G's for like 25, 30 years uh, before the flick got made, man. And then when that money faucet turned off (laughs) at at a certain point, it's not like he's like counting on it, but through repetition, it's there. Yeah. It's interesting because like, Girl Scouts has been optioned like uh, about four times now throughout this 20 something year history. And, you know, nothing has quite come of it. We did make the live action pilot that I mentioned. Um, but it's one of those things where, yeah, you still get paid off having the IP, you know, and, um, for me doing it as an animated show, there was so much pressure of like, okay, well, obviously it's going to look like my art style, I have to assemble and oversee and art direct this team that's going to bring that vision to life. Like that's a lot of pressure. You know what I mean? So eventually Peter Chung dropped out as our director. So I was scurrying and calling all my connections in LA to uh, figure out who would be the best director and stressing out over that kind of stuff. So um, when it didn't work out, I was upset, but then, getting back to just doing the comic, there was almost like this sense of relief that washed over me. That was like, okay, shit. Well, at least I don't have to worry about the cartoon being made incorrectly or poorly like that. Live action is one thing, but it's like, if it was animated and it didn't fit the tone, the vibe of, of my work, my world, my style, it would be like, it would almost be like the uh, brand was tarnished. You know what I mean? So um, it's exciting, but there's also like this huge amount of pressure of everybody looking at the visuals and being like, this is some crazy shit. Like, how are we going to pull this off? You know? So whereas with comics, as you guys know, it's just you, the creator with your ink and paper pulling off whatever you want to do. And that, that to me, um, that, you know, I was reminded of that, man. When, like when I went to Japan, I'm, Ed, you and I had that talk on kayfabe after I got back. I mean, that like was a game changer for me. I was over there looking at all this art, manga, all these books. And I was like, wait, you can, you can just do whatever you want. Like I always thought my stuff was bugged out and unique on its own, but I, I was in Japan. I was like, I'm not even pushing my shit as far as I can. Like you can literally do anything in this medium. And and that's to me, the most exciting part of it. So with this new Girl Scout series, I've been trying to utilize that idea of like, play, put it in outer space, set it in outer space. Like do a, this is a brand new storyline, by the way, brand new Girl Scout character that I'm introducing. She comes from the lineage of the very first Girl Scout dating back to feudal Japan so you don't have to read any of the other books to understand this series. You can jump on cold and, and get it. But basically I was like, set it in outer space, D- introduce all new characters, um, have like little Gordy, this little octopus guy, a talking octopus is in it now. 
Uh, there's shape-shifting demonic entities. There's, uh, I'll show you guys a double page spread here. There's, um, you know, crazy psychedelic occult kind of stuff going on. Um, you know, it's like whatever you want to do. This is the stack, by the way. <laughs> Love That's it. the first uh, five issues. So I'm working on six right now. But um, the you know what I mean? Original it, it, art is like the ultimate cartoonist porn. Yeah, oh, totally. yeah, yeah, like yeah Seeing that yeah. stack is so great. There's another uh, double pager. Yeah, that's so awesome. You know, man, my, my experience going to Japan, it was the exact same thing, man. Like I was starting Red Room right before I right before I split. And when I went out there, the sort of common thing that I saw in everybody's work, because I met a lot of mangaka and and, you know, just I saw a lot of stuff. It's like if you think you pushed things as far as they could go there's still more room yes. to go. Yeah, you still have to keep uh, moving forward and, and it could be more far out, man. Yeah, that, that was that my was big, that was my big takeaway, man. And uh, speaking of Japan, I also have to mention our friend Peach Momoko did this brilliant uh, variant cover for issue one, absolutely stunning. And uh, I love seeing my characters interpreted by other artists, of course. And I wanted to do something very special for Kayfabe and make a world premiere announcement. This hasn't been announced or shown anywhere, but uh, for issue two variant cover, we have a young gentleman named Jim Rugg who uh, provided the absolutely badass variant cover for issue two. So check that out. Um, and if I can brag a little bit, I also own the original art, which is right here. Uh, get the gleam off there. But this is um, this is ballpoint pen and color pencil, I believe. Right, Jim? I don't think there's any color pencil. I think it's all ballpoint pen. Okay. <laughs> you have ballpoint. Damn, man. Okay. So this is on, um, yeah, ballpoint on loose leaf. And uh, I'm going to get this, this guy frame. Thanks again. Thanks again so much for doing it, man. I have uh, Ma Food artwork to show off. This is like Ma Food Appreciation Day here. But uh, the Octobriana piece that, that Jim drew last year whenever I was running my Kickstarter ended up in my hands. So I need to get it to a frame shop and get it on my wall. But absolutely love it. And I mean, this is, you know, this is the, your style is so strong. It comes through both in color, line, shape, all those elements. So it was very exciting for me to, to get a sneak peek of that new Girl Scout series uh, in order to do that cover. So I'm looking forward to seeing the books in print. Me too, man. Yeah, I uh, think I sent you the first four issues. So hopefully it's cool because um, this character you drew, the the cyborg assassin guy, uh, his name's Nottis. In issue four, he's in this dream sequence where he manifests as this early 90s like comic character with all the shoulder pads and all the weaponry and stuff. And I love that you put him in that for your cover. Of course, seems obvious, but it's also a bit of uh, foreshadowing. Of, it, of it makes a lot of come. sense to me, that 90s version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks again, man. It's, it's, uh, I have an all-star lineup of talent doing variant covers for each issue. And um, Image is all easy to work with for me. I mean, they're always behind my projects. I basically just ask Eric Stevenson do you want to publish the next thing? And he says, yes. And then I just turn it in and it comes out. So there's really no, you know, editorial interference or anything. It's just uh, my vision, a hundred percent. That's what I want to do. You know, I think that's a real parallel with, uh, with Darrow too. Like one of the things that I noticed is, is we've been, you know, getting to know him and talking to him more is how much like everything for him is get to the comics, yeah. you know, like, like, yeah, go do matrix work and then come back it, it, you know it, it allows him to do the comics part where he can do whatever he wants yeah again like the greatest part of comics is finding that space where you can do it and the awesome thing is like somebody new to comics starting out fresh kid in school whatever they can do that you know like when you're self-publishing that is that apex in terms of creative freedom um i i hope people making comics recognize that part that that appeal and really exploit it lean into it like you're saying about go to japan and see how far that's pushed like just push this stuff, you know, let it be your work. 
Um, you know, don't try to make it look like someone else's or, or whatever is selling or whatever. Just from this conversation here in the kind of like trials and tribulations with uh, these other these other media where, you know, there are directors involved, other other cogs in the machine uh, for the antisocial uh, <laughs> comics creator. That would make you go fucking nuts if you don't have your own creative thing that you could just do without asking any kind of like permission or, mm-hmm. or something like that. Like just. You, you make your thing, uh, firm believer in the whole like, you know, adventure, excitement, Jedi craves not these things kind of energy where it's like, you don't think about that Hollywood bullshit. If that shit comes, that shit comes. Because right now, like uh, the, the sort of offers that come down the pike because of like the kind of Hollywood minded comic creators that are out there, those numbers have never been lower. Like I was t- yeah. talking about those Harvey P card numbers. You don't get that right. anymore. Maybe right. you know, BKV gets that or something, man. But just like <laughs> you, the, the average cartoonist is not going to get those offers from like a Netflix. So like, why would you sell your baby for peanuts to have it just kind of abused? Uh, just make your comic, man. And if somebody's really serious, they're going to give you a really serious offer. And uh, one of the things that I learned, like playing that, playing that game is and this might be different for disney just because they have endless loot but i you know i had participated in some stuff for like adult swim and uh the thing that i learned was you just make the project so expensive like (laughs) like like you get that company to spend so much money no matter what happens they will put it out but it might be contractually precluded from saying anything (laughs) negative (laughs) about anything i worked in uh (laughs) <laughs> in a Hollywood space, man. But uh, I think you get the picture. And, uh, you know, ever since then, I haven't collaborated with almost a soul because of the disappointment that I had in uh, dealing with all that stuff, man. So the lesson of today's episode, man, put your fucking head down, sharpen your pencil, make some comics. For me, comics is always the thing I can go back to. So like half my career, I'm doing, you know, maybe freelance work or whatever, illustration work. Um, but the other half of the time, the time that's the most well-spent and enjoyable for me is being in my universe, doing my, my work, you know? And like I said, when you can just do whatever you want, you don't have to answer to anyone. That's the best way to spend creative time. That's, that's sort of what Jeff Darrow, like the whole Jeff Darrow thing. It's like you, like you buy your comic drawing time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll design some Sentinel things for, for matrix. That'll give me, you know. 10 years to, 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 to make yeah. a comic. It's noteworthy too, you know, Jim holds up the history of Girl Scouts and several volumes still in print and available. Yeah. The other benefit of doing this stuff, you know, keep making those books because they don't have to go away, especially if you own them, you can you can sort of continue to sell those uh, and continue to to send your work out into the world. Yeah, yeah. another, it, it, you're depending on another company to sort of, you know, ra- take care of your baby and they can just like bury it. They can make it, not exist anymore. Yeah. And certainly make people not curious about uh, your comics, which at the end of the day, all of this kind of Hollywood bullshit, all it is is just a commercial to sell more comics, unless you're trying to go become a director or something, you know, like if you're a cartoonist and you make books, that's really where the benefit comes. Cause it's not like you're keyed into like net profits of uh, whatever flick gets made or something like some uh, points on the back end. Yeah. I don't (laughs) think that happens, man. (laughs) Tom, it's been a while uh, since since you uh, since we had a weekly. Yeah, you're back in the house, man. You were gone for for almost a year. Okay, yeah. and uh, Kirby came out during mm-hmm. uh, yeah. during COVID times. Uh, there was a free comic book day comic. Uh, is there anything you're working on now? Like, you want to talk about the experience of Kirby? Yeah, I, I mean that was like like Jim when you you're talking about like all the stuff you did pre pandemic it's almost like a best case scenario because you got all the travel and stuff and all this great stuff out of your system before you were sort of forced into lockdown. But for me, it was like the opposite. Like I was in lockdown for like two years working on the Jack Kirby book and the Fantastic Four book. And then it's like, okay, like it's going to be rumspringa when I finish this thing. (laughs) And then it's like, okay, you're stuck at home, you know, for for a year. (laughs) Now everybody knows we're definitely in Pittsburgh <laughs> with, 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 with Amish. Uh, <laughs> you can't talk about what you're working on now. Well, yet? yeah, the thing I'm working on right now, I can't, uh, I can't talk about. Um, it's it's pretty early, but it's 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 kind of it's pretty fun. It's um, you know I'm I'm putting a ton of, you know it's it's basically like 
like during the COVID time, I kind of spent like all my time kind of like developing my own, you know, my own uh, properties, you know, like, like, like Jim's talking about with like Girl Scouts and stuff. I'm, I was developing all that kind of stuff, but it's like, I, I get like a little shot of adrenaline when it's like, here's some brand name thing that we're going to hand you the keys to. Like, I know it's, it's probably not best for like my bottom line or whatever, but like it, it like makes me sort of come alive. It's like, you know, Frankenstein getting struck by a bolt of lightning. That's what happened. So it's like, I'm doing one of those kind of things right now. So a a dream project. Yeah, exactly. I keep getting to do these dream projects where it's like, you know, like I, I can't believe I'm getting to like do this thing that was like such a big deal to me when I was like three. You Dream know? project. I think that's a hint, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Little Nemo and Slumberland <laughs> no, Grand Design. I'm doing the Sandman. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Gaiman's handing the Sandman over to me and I'm taking over. <laughs> a lot of exclusive announcements here today, huh? <laughs> it's a lot of pressure, Tom, to, to take on the entire... Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm up for it. I, th- I think, you know, <laughs> Neil Gaiman, Tom Scholey, that, that makes sense. It's like a, you know, like a uh, exponential <laughs> curve upward. Neil Gaiman, man, join us for a shoot interview one time. <laughs> yeah, especially after this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you say, guys? Man, it's been about a half. Jim, thanks for joining us, man. Uh, give some plugs for that Girl Scouts joint real quick. When is first issue coming out? Yes, uh, Girl Scout Stone Ghost first issue November 24th in stores. You can pre order through your local comic shop up to November 1st. Um, my cover, Peach Momoko uh, variant cover. Check it out. You guys are going to dig it. Something completely different for the newsstands. And I um, think everybody, everybody's really going to enjoy it. Uh, you can check me out on social media just under my name at Jim Mafood on Instagram, Twitter, jimmafood.com if you want to buy uh, comics, prints, et cetera. And you guys, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Jim, once again, man, we miss you, dude. Can't wait to go uh, to some sort of festival, go up to the Pacific Northwest, chop it up, hang out, man, see what's going on. Take another sneak peek in your studio. That's Definitely. Message, yeah, it's long overdue for sure. How do we get out of here? Let me think. If we only had something to tell people at home to do. Ah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. action item. Make more comics.